which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And so Christ's authority, Christ's rule, even in terms of him being king, is preeminent. It is supreme. It is not comparable to the kingdoms of the world. And therefore, when we talk about the preeminence of Christ and his authority and his kingship, then we must see that he is above all others. And this kingship also was proclaimed in the book of Revelation. If you look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. John the Revelator says of Christ that he is the ruler over all the kings of the earth. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over all the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us, Christ is supreme over all kingdoms. And there are very, very many other scriptures that show that Christ as king is also preeminent. But let us now go to the crux of our text this morning. I just wanted to share with you that little bit in verse 13 that shows the preeminence of Christ also as king, as king, and who has authority over all other kings. Now we are told in verse 15 of that uh, text that Christ is the image of the invisible God. And I would like us to just look at the word image. Image, as used there, from the little research I was able to do, means likeness. He is the likeness. He is the figurative likeness, if you like, an image or a figure of one which accurately represents another. That is the image that is used there to describe how Christ reflects who God is. When you and I were coming here this morning, I'm sure 90% of you, after you dressed up, you stood in front of the mirror. Why? So that you could have an idea of what you look like. Is your tie straight? Is your hair combed? You must have checked. If your buttons are all in place, and it is the image of the mirror that you saw that either assured you that you are okay or told you you need to make one or two more adjustments. That image that you saw in the mirror is a true reflection of your outward look. It, it is a true reflection, especially if your mirror is good. If it is a very old mirror, it may mislead you. But if it is a brand new mirror that is very good, it showed you how your outward look alike is. It may not show, have shown you how the intestines look, because inside there you could be having uh, uh, the stomach virus just building up. That you did not see, but at least the outward part of you, you are able to see. Now the difference between that image that you saw into the mirror and the image that is described of Christ here is that in this particular image, Christ reflects God completely. He reflects God completely. In him are not only the way God looks and all the characters of God wholesomely, but even how God feels and thinks and acts and creates and, and God's power and God's omnipresence and God's omnipotence and God's everything is in Christ. 
So that when we say that Christ is the image of the invisible God, we mean that he's, he's not the image of the deity in this context, even though the fullness of the deity dwells in him. Not the image of himself like you looking at yourself in a mirror, even though he is the true God. He is not in this context the image of the spirit, even though the spirit proceeds from him. But here he is shown as the image of God the Father. That is the true reflection of God the Father. Yet somehow, still, God the Father does not exclude the Son. They are all together in one. It is a mystery, isn't it? That Christ is who he is, a reflection of God. Yet not excluding the Spirit. Yet not excluding the Father. Because the three persons is what makes the Godhead, the Trinity. Christ is God. Christ is God. Christ is to be worshipped as we worship God because he is God. Many people will say that Noel looks like me because he is my son. But is Noel me? No. He is distinctly a different individual resembling as we may resemble granted but he is different. We even share the name of Witi. He's also called Noel Witi. I'm Kennedy Witi. But we are different. So we are sharing certain attributes. We share a name. We share some likenesses. We share some traits, characteristics. Sometimes when he speaks, even I think I'm hearing myself. But I'm not him. Not so when it comes to Christ and God. When Christ speaks, God speaks. When Christ is creating, God is creating. When Christ is serving, God is serving. When Christ does anything, God is doing that very thing. He is the image of God. A reflection of who God is. Tell me who else in all creation can be described thus, except Christ. Hence, his preeminence. You know, we too have been told by the word of God that we have been created in the image of God, haven't we? Because in the book of Genesis, as creation happened, the Godhead sat together and said, let us create man in our own image after our own likeness. And so man was created in the image of God. Both male and female. We were created. When Pastor Tony took us through Genesis, we saw those things. The creation story, the beginnings. And it was marvelous, wasn't it? But even though we were created in the image of God, we are not God. We only have certain reflections of the image of God. Few attributes here and there of the image of God. But we are not a reflection of who God is, like Christ is. And so, it is heresy, my brothers and sisters, for anyone to tell you that like God, you can also create. That like God, you can also proclaim things into existence. That you can say, sickness, I bind you. I decree, as God would do, that you leave me. And since I have decreed, you have left me. 
whether I'm still feeling sick or not, you have left. No, 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 no. That is when we try to, to reflect the image of God as only Christ can reflect. It is Christ who was able to forgive sin. You remember one of the problems he had? Is when he told someone who was lame, your sins are forgiven, you get up. And, and the Pharisees said, who is this man who thinks he, he is God, he can forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. And, and Christ says, but which one is easier? I can do it any way I want. Which is easier? Do I just tell the man to get up and walk or tell him forgive? Anything I say, it will work the same result. Okay, if that is what you want to hear, okay, pick up your mat and go. And the man picked up his mat and went. Why? Because he is the image of God. But we are told that he is not only the image of God, that God of whom he is the image is described as the invisible God. We have just been singing immortal, invisible God. Immortal, invisible God. Why is it that God is described there as invisible? One, to show you the particular God, the distinct identity of the God by way of description, who Christ is an image of. You got that? To distinctly identify the God allegedly that he is an image of. He is not the image of just any God you may think about. No. He is the image of a God who is invisible. No man has ever seen God except Jesus has declared. In John 1, 18, In John chapter 1, verse 18, which I will read quickly. The Bible says as follows. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only, who is the Father's, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Now, the day that Tony's young son was born, we heard about it because he posted on the wall or sent text. At that point, <laughs> you were only the one who had seen the boy. If it was a boy or a girl, only you knew together with the mother. We did not know. We had to rely on his assertions, his claim that they had a boy and not a girl. Isn't it? Because none of us had seen the child. But later on, when we saw the child, we could say, yeah, 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 it's a boy. We have seen for ourselves. John is saying, that no human being has been able to lay their corporeal eyes, these eyes that we have, the bodily eyes on God to see him like this. And that we must only depend to know who God is on someone who has seen him. And John declares that the only person who has seen God is one person. Why one person? Because we know all even angels have seen him. Well, the only person who has come from where he is to where we are is how many people? One. And that, that is the person who has been given authority to sit at the right hand side of God. And the Bible describes and identifies that person as Christ. He is the only person who has 
even when he was on earth in human bodily form could in his heart and in his mind and in his senses recollect who god looks like he, because he's the only one who had seen him whether that god is spirit he is the one who may have perceived that spirit whether that god is has a form which we are told he does not have and we are not supposed to think about what kind of form he may be having lest we profane his glory he is the only one who knows and not that that he just knows god or that he has seen him he has perfect knowledge of god perfect knowledge of him we are told of the angels who serve god that they hide their faces but we are not told anywhere in the scriptures that when christ sees god he hides his face we are not told that why because christ is perfectly holy even as his father is perfectly holy though we have seen god intellectually when we perceive these things that are written and we listen to his characteristics when we study the word of god when we listen to the things that christ said when we listen to and read the things that the apostles said when preaching is done in the church we have a visualization in our minds we can't help it because we are human beings of who god may be not in terms of his form but at least in terms of his character we know that he is all powerful we know that our god is everywhere at the same time psalm 139 tells us that there is no place where we can hide but he is there he who knows a word when it is still not yet out of our lips and he knows it all together completely we know that our god is omniscient but we have never seen him we have never seen him that god that invisible god is the one of whom christ is the perfect image he is the one of whom christ is he the god who is not known to us physically the incomprehensible god of all creation the one of providence and grace the god of love who loves his enemies and is willing to send his son to die for them the one who is a mystery and of whose character we may never fully understand on this side of glory i don't even know that we will have the ability to know god fully when we go to heaven we have not seen him we have not seen him immediately in other words i have not seen him the way i see ezra now that is what is called immediately we have only seen him immediately when christ has mediated a seeing of his father when through christ we have seen him we have not known him physically his person his perfections we have not known immediately but maybe when the saints are taken home when we go to be go- with god when we shall see him face to face when our faith will be turned into sight oh then we will know him and we will sing the songs of moses and the songs of the saints before him praising him and then on that day we will remove our crowns and throw them to the ground and say worthy is the lamb who was slain take our crowns and build up your crown with them for we are not worthy to have crowns before you as jesus himself said in john 14:7 to 9 he says he who has seen me 
has seen the Father. If you have seen me, you have seen my Father. And if you look at Hebrews, let's just turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. The writer to the church, I mean to the to the Hebrews has a point there. 1, 3. When he, he talks of Christ, he says the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation and look at that word i do not know how esv puts it who has an esv how does esv put it there yeah? the imprint the imprint of his nature it's like when you have your your shoes and you step into mud and you lift it and you can see the imprint of your shoe sole on the mud That is how exact. And, and the NIV, which is more explanatory, says the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. He is the exact image of the God we have not seen. Paul also wrote to the Corinthians and told them, Christ is the image of God. In, first, in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Christ is the image of God. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, he tells them that in the face of Jesus Christ is the knowledge of the glory of God. You see Jesus Christ, you see the glory of God. You get to know the glory of God, who God is, because that is what his glory means. From those passages, we learn that Jesus is accurately and fully and completely an expression of the being and the perfection and the glory and the majesty and the power and the dominion of the invisible God, the one that we are yet to see. By looking at Jesus as he is revealed to us in the word of God, we see God. We can now say we know God the Father. For we have read of Jesus. We have known him from the word of God. He is the natural, essential, and eternal image of God the Father. An increased one. Which we can see perfect and complete. Yes, he's distinct from the Father in that he is one of the persons of the Trinity, yet one with him, and in no way inferior to him, he is in the Father, and the Father is in him. And as I said before, he is a mystery. No wonder we are called to worship the Son. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Until I make all your enemies a footstool to your feet. So then we go ahead. We are told that he is the image of the invisible God. But the verse goes ahead to say something else which I want to say. That he is the firstborn of all creation. The firstborn of all creation. Concerning that term, firstborn, it can mean, for example, the first one born, isn't it? <coughs> for example, the first one born in a house. And so some have therefore concluded that if that must be the meaning of it, which is the natural human meaning of firstborn, then that Christ was born. Or that if he was not born, in the sense that he was born by Mary, 
then that he is a creature because he, talk, he talks about the firstborn over all creation in other versions you talk, you see the firstborn of all but i like the N niv's way of putting it the firstborn over over all creation from my reading of it and you know this is one of the areas where the jehovah witnesses have a problem because of this <laughs> phrase that he is the firstborn so they say no 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 he cannot be god because he was also born and he must be created because he is the firstborn of all create, uh, creatures or of creation for that matter but for my reading of it my brothers and sisters the reference to christ as the firstborn here preeminently and superiorly show that he occupies a rank of privilege over all creation as a firstborn son or daughter would occupy over all the other siblings he comes first it is not the crux of the matter is not hot on his being born as much as it is on the authority and the position Christ holds he is regarded by God as a father regards his firstborn the first child it is much more a question of rank and authority of privileges that he enjoys don't you remember that even though god has created all else he refers to israel as in exodus chapter 4 verse 22 exodus and chapter 4 verse 22 then say to pharaoh this is what the lord says israel is my firstborn son and i told you let my son go so he may worship me but you refuse to let him go so i will kill your firstborn son now when god says israel is his firstborn son it does not mean that israel was created first does it no adam was created first and israel and jacob and isaac and all those people even together with us are generations of who of adam and eve we are flowing generation out of adam and eve but because of god's decree of election his decision to elect israel as his chosen tribe and nation he refers to them as the firstborn at that point in time he looks at them in with favor as the elect of god the elect nation and so they become superior in ranking isn't it and so he does not want any nations to fight them and whoever fights the israelites god comes to their defense and ensures that even when they are few they win their battles and so christ in similar manner ranks as first amongst us again look at psalms 89 psalms 89 verse 20 27 where god refers to david similarly psalms 89 I know I'm running out of time, so I'll be winding up now. Psalms 89 and verse 20. I have found David my servant. With my sacred oil, I have anointed him. And then in um, 27, I will also appoint him my firstborn, the most exalted of kings of the earth so then he refers to david in that manner that he will appoint 
him as the firstborn. And yet we know that David was the youngest of all his brothers, isn't it? He was the youngest. It is a question of the position that he holds. Therefore, any interpretation of this term must be in harmony by what is taught by Christ elsewhere. And Jesus Christ is clearly proclaimed to be the creator of all things in John 1. 1 to 3, that he is the creator of all things. All things were created for him. In Colossians 1.16, which we are just reading. Therefore, it is in that sense that he is the firstborn. He ranks supreme. He is the ruler of all creation. Christ was not created. Christ was begotten. And the purpose of using this phrase, that Christ is the firstborn of all creation, is to show how preeminent he is of all creation. He has all the rights of one who is a firstborn, and much more. Just as God, he was declared that he is a firstborn. Just as Israel was declared to be a firstborn over the nations of the earth, just as David was declared to be the firstborn, even though he was not the firstborn of his father. So God has declared Christ to be the firstborn over all creation. My brothers and my sisters, Christ whom we worship is God. He is to be worshipped. He is to be listened to. Little wonder then, the heavens would open and God would proclaim to the hearing of everyone, this is my beloved son. In him, I am well pleased. In another place, he says, this is my son, listen to him. Listen to him. May we, as we consider these things about Christ, about his supremacy, about his preeminence, about his being the image of the invisible God and the firstborn over all creation, then adore him and worship him. Then love him more and trust him. Trust him to take us home. Trust him to fully be able to save us. Amen. I will ask that we sing the closing hymn, and then after we have sung the closing hymn, I will come back and do the benediction. <laughs>